Hello friend, whoever you are. Hope you're having a good day. Just want to share a couple of thoughts with you. Uh, things that I've been thinking about since I had a conversation with a good friend of mine on the phone yesterday. It was a very enlivening conversation. And one of the things that we we discussed were, were the seven letters of Jesus to the seven churches in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. And every time I really think about those seven letters of Jesus, it's always so, uh, when I really consider the implications of them, not just for them, but for us, for our churches, uh, it's very concerning, it's very awakening, it's, it has an, an enlivening, it, en, it enlivens me, um, but it also really concerns me. And it's so strange. It's a strangely neglected um, part of Scripture. So many of us in the Protestant Church, we love books like Galatians and Ephesians and Romans and John. And those are great books. Obviously, they're the, they're the Word of God. We should love those things. But here is this part of Scripture where there are seven letters from the risen Jesus to a group of churches living at the end of the first century. A lot of people say things like, why didn't Jesus write anything? Uh, I, I wish Jesus had, had written something so that we could hear what he had to say. He did. Paul dictated some of his letters to a scribe. Uh, he didn't literally write all of his letters with his own hand. And it's the same situation here. Jesus dictated these letters to John, who wrote them down. These are seven epistles from the Son of God, the risen Son of God. And why would we not pour over these passages? Why would we not study them and and memorize them and um, focus on them? We want, we want to know, what, what does Jesus think of our churches today? What would he say to us today? How would he, what does he consider to be a faithful church? And what are some reasons why he might warn a church? What are some reasons why he might remove a church uh, from being his church? I mean, it's all, it's all, a lot of this stuff is in those letters, um, I think if we want if we want to know, okay, where are we at? Where do we stand with Jesus? What does he think of us? How does he look at us? What would he say to us today? We can get a good idea of that from these two chapters, tra chapters 2 and 3 in Revelation. I think part of the reason that we should be really concerned is is that these are churches that are living at the end of the first century. The Apostle John is, is likely still alive. He's installing leaders. He's strengthening the churches. They are living at a time when the cost of following Jesus, the cost of being his church, is far greater than anything most of us experience today. And so they would have to be a whole lot more serious about this just just because of the time and the place that they were living, right? Um, they're living in a time when the church practiced obedience to his commandments far more literally and seriously. And, and yet he warns them. Uh, five out of the seven churches are warned. Only two of the churches that are living at this time of, of persecution and greater cost than what we experience today, only two of them are not warned. He says to, I think, Pergamum and, uh, Phil and, Pergamum and Philadelphia, I think. You can have that wrong. <clears throat> or Smyrna. Smyrna. I believe it's Smyrna and Philadelphia. He says to them, hold on to what you have. Just stay where, you know, just, just keep going. Hang on. Make it to the end, and you're going to be okay. You're going to make it. Right, But the other five churches, he says, um, he has some really good things to say about them. But then he warns them. And this is where I think we should be really concerned. Because I think some of the churches he warns, 
if if we think about how he describes their life and we think about how we measure up to them um we make them look pretty good if if we could if we could for example if if we could sort of spend a week with the church in Ephesus or the church in Laodicea and just look at their lives look at how you know what christian life looked like at that time um, what their daily lives looked like, um, we might, I, th- I think we would say, wow, these people are pretty devoted. Like, they're pretty serious about following Jesus in comparison to us. Um, and yet Jesus warns them. So Ephesus, he says to them, you guys are bearing up for my name's sake. You, you haven't grown weary. You're being careful to refute false teaching, right? You're, you're exposing false apostles and 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 you you haven't given up right <clears throat> and and you would expect him to say okay you know good good job you 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 you're 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 good to go just just hang it no but he he warns them he says but i have this against you i have this against you you've lost the love you had in the beginning and then he says what you need to do is repent and do the works that you did in the beginning if you don't I'm going to come to you and remove your lampstand. And the lampstands represent the churches. What he's saying is, I'm going to remove you as my church. You're not going to be my church anymore. Um, La- Laodicea is another good example. They uh, have become casual towards Jesus, lukewarm towards him. Uh, it sounds like they're rich and comfortable. And he warns them. And... <clears throat> Um, and when you really think about that, that's really concerning because the people in Laodicea could not fathom the kind of luxury and riches that we enjoy today. And if they are rich and comfortable, if they are casual towards Jesus, who are living at a time of persecution, um, what, where are we at? What's he going to say to us? So s- some of these churches... Uh, I think it's it's when you really think about it in comparison to us they're doing well but Jesus warns them and often he warns them just for having one problem they've lost the love they had in the beginning they become lukewarm they become uh, some of them have become sexually immoral and just one problem he warns them and, and not just a, a warning of like, uh, you know, you're not going to have the intimacy with me that you could have. No, no, a warning of, I'm going to blot your name out of the book of life. I'm going to spit you out. I'm going to remove you as my church. I'm going to come against you. Those kinds of things. Those kinds of warnings. Salvation kinds of warnings. And <clears throat> just for one problem. So what would he say to a church like many of our churches that combine all of these problems and more? a church where many of the people have, they started out strong, but then over the years they fizzled out and now they're just sort of coasting through life, you know, um, kind of just, just sort of, just sort of coasting along, going through the motions. Like they've lost their first love or a, a, a church that in addition to that, the majority of the men are addicted to pornography or entangled in sexual immorality. And in addition to that, most of the people are rich and comfortable and they're enjoying a, a, a quality of life that's unnecessary. They're enjoying all kinds of creature comforts that are unnecessary, spending all kinds of, of time and money on things just because they want them that are unnecessary. Um, what's he going to say to a, a, a church that combines those things, right? Or what's he going to say to a church that's casual about his commandments? Uh, his commandments about marriage or his commandments about wealth or non-resistance. You know, a group of people that sort of, you know, says, well, you know, whatever you believe about these things is okay. You know, um, it's not a salvation issue. We can agree to disagree on these things. Just sort of has this, this, this very, very nonchalant attitude about the things that he's commanded. Um, so if he says these things to them, if he has these warnings for these churches um, that are living at a time of, of greater cost than what we experience, 
and and if he warns them for just having one problem then what what can we expect he would say to us today and um i think when you when you really think about this very it would be very easy to just you know shrug this off and go back to facebook and netflix and and movie land and just 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 check out but when you really stay in this and think about this friends we are in terrible trouble and a lot of us think of our of our churches we know that something isn't wrong but we think that it's almost like our church has caught a cold and we need to tweak something you know we got some things to repent for we should get a little more serious no we we don't have a cold we, what we have is more like stage 4 cancer and we are in a situation where we don't just need to get a little more serious, but we need to let our laughter turn to mourning. We need to repent, get on our faces, and beg God to forgive us for being so nonchalant toward His Son. We need to fast and pray for forgiveness and for power to change and to get unentangled from all of the world's distractions and deceptions and we just need a, a, a we just need to turn our lives upside down and um, and have a real awakening and uh, anyway just some thoughts that I wanted to share with you I, I hope that's helpful uh, and, and and if if you feel afraid about that like I like I I do <laughs> I, I sometimes feel really afraid about this. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. Jesus did not say these things um, because he doesn't want us to experience fear and trembling. He said these things to help us um, realize the seriousness of our situation and so that we would walk the narrow path and take this very seriously and enter his kingdom in the end. That's what he wants for us. And so um, if you feel that way, that's a good thing. That's a sign that the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Thank you so much for watching, and God bless you.